Hey, New Life. So here we come to it, our final week, dealing with the death and the resurrection of Jesus. This story, the Gospels focus on more than any other in the life of Jesus. Of course, this is also going to be something that the entire rest of the New Testament is going to repeat over and over again. The death and the resurrection of Jesus. That is the cornerstone of our faith. It's the foundation of who we are as followers of Jesus. I wanna to talk today, though, about the events. What happened? Who were the characters involved? What was the setting? And ultimately, what happened to Jesus? And why is this event so foundational for our faith and our lives today. The setting of the story is Passover. Passover was one of the three pilgrimage holidays within Judaism that brought Jews from all over the world into Jerusalem. God commanded in the law of Moses that every able-bodied male would come to Jerusalem for the festivals of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. So they came for Passover to celebrate the Passover. The Jewish writer of the first century, Josephus, says that the population would swell three times its normal size. The average rough population estimates of Jerusalem in the first century is around 30, 40,000. So we're looking at over 100,000 people now crowding into the city. What was the Passover all about in the first century? Because the temple stood in Jerusalem and the temple was where you celebrated the Passover, the center of the Passover celebration was the sacrifice and the eating of the Passover lamb. People would come, they would buy a sacrifice, and then they would slaughter it. And Luke tells us this very thing beginning in Luke 22:7. Then the day came of the unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb was sacrificed. That was the main celebration, slaughtering the lamb and eating it that night. The Passover sacrifice was the only sacrifice that the one who brought it slaughtered. The priest didn't do it. So when Jesus tells Peter and John to go and prepare the Passover, he's not just saying get ready for the party. He's actually telling them to slaughter the lamb. They would have roasted it. That night, they were going to eat it all. They had to eat it completely. Now, originally, the law of Moses commanded that the Passover be eaten in the presence of the Lord, meaning in the tabernacle or in the temple, as we read about in the book of Chronicles. But in the first century, the logistics just did not permit for everybody that was a pilgrim in Jerusalem to crowd into the temple courts on the Temple Mount. So the Pharisees said that the sanctity of the temple extended to the walled city of Jerusalem. So as long as you ate the Passover in Jerusalem, you have fulfilled your obligation to God. And that's exactly what Jesus is going to do. He and his disciples come together to eat the meal. Now today, some of you may be familiar with a Passover Seder meal. This is a meal that is developed within the Jewish community that has its own liturgy. In fact, the liturgy is written in what is called the Haggadah. This is the telling of the Passover tale where there are symbolic acts throughout the meal and the eating of a meal together. That did not exist in the first century. In the first century, it was all about eating the lamb, having the meat in front of them. And that's why Jesus says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you. The modern day Passover Seder meal developed in the centuries after the destruction of Jerusalem in the first century. So what is practiced today in Jewish homes and in the Jewish community does not parallel what was there in the first century. Let me give you one quick example. Today, symbolically, there are four cups of wine strategically drank through the meal. In the first century, there were only two. And so they would come together, they would eat the meal, 
And in the midst of this meal, Jesus is going to give his disciples an object lesson based on one of the cups and based on the brokenness of the bread. And of course, we remember that every time we come together and take communion. After finishing the meal, Jesus and his disciples are going to go out onto the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives sits at the eastern boundary of the city of Jerusalem. Now, in the week prior to the Passover meal, Jesus has been staying in Bethany. Why didn't he go back to Bethany? Because Bethany was further than a Jew could travel on a holiday or on the Sabbath. So he goes out to the Mount of Olives. And here we need to understand a little bit about the geography of Jerusalem. The Mount of Olives sits at the eastern edge of the city. But just to the east of the Mount of Olives, over the brow of the hill, begins the wilderness. When David has to flee from his son Absalom, he goes over the Mount of Olives and di disappears into the wilderness. When Jesus is on the Mount of Olives, he is going to take his disciples and pray. And his prayer is going to be, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. Understand that when he's praying that prayer, if he walked less than one hour, he would be in the wilderness. And Pilate and Caiaphas would never catch him. In other words, Jesus prays this prayer. He wrestles with the will of God for his life with his hand on the door of escape. Think about that moment a second. He wrestled with God's will. But the one who taught his disciples to pray, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, praise the same prayer. Now I want us to put ourselves in Jesus' place for just a moment. We know what's coming. We know the suffering, the torture, the agony, the death. And we're right there at the door of escape. What do we do? Often we think that being spiritual means stepping up in the big moments. But understand, it's in the common, the ordinary, and the mundane moments of our lives that we prepare ourselves to answer the bell in the big moment. Jesus grew up, and every day he would have recited, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Him doing that was seen as accepting upon himself God's rule and reign. What impact do you think that that had on Jesus' life? That every day, every moment from the moment he remembered himself, he made it a daily habit to submit to God's rule and reign. Can I suggest to you, had he not done that, things may have turned out differently. But because Jesus disciplined himself in the ordinary and in the mundane moments of his life, when the most crucial moment in human history presented itself, he was ready and he turned his back on the door of escape and he turned to face the cross. After he's done praying, Judas is going to lead the temple guard of the chief priests out to arrest him. Remember, they're doing it under the cloak of darkness because the crowds in Jerusalem hung on Jesus' every word. He was popular with the crowds. They had to use darkness to cover up their activity. Also notice how Jesus highlighted their duplicity. He says, 
I was teaching every day in the temple. Why didn't you arrest me then? The implication, because they couldn't, because of the popularity of the people. The people never turned against him. And we also see this in the book of Acts. When the people of Jerusalem continued to support Jesus' followers and movement against the chief priests, their scribes, and the Sadducean aristocracy of Jerusalem. This same unholy trinity that we find responsible here. One of Jesus' disciples is going to grab the sword and strike the ear of the servant of the high priest. And notice the one who commanded us to love our enemies. What does he do in that moment? He healed this man's ear. I find it fascinating that in Jesus' final hours, he presents to us a model of how to live in obedience with everything that he's taught us to this point. He's then taken away to the house of the high priest. And there, seated in the courtyard of the house, he is going to spend the remainder of the night. Guess who's in that courtyard along with him? Of course, the guard, but so's Peter. And in the midst of this courtyard, where, with Jesus sitting right there, Peter's going to deny him three times. And Jesus, of course, had told Peter, this is exactly what would happen, that before cock crow, you will deny me three times. One of the things that I love about the Gospels is when we begin to understand the world of the Gospels, they give us so much detail. One of those details is cock crow. Now we know from Jewish sources that you were not allowed to raise roosters and chickens in Jerusalem because of issues of purity. So this is not some random rooster cock-a-doodle-doing in Jerusalem. Rather, cock crow referred to a very specific moment in the pre-dawn hours when a priest would blow the trumpet from the temple, acting like an alarm clock to all the priests in Jerusalem, calling them to come to the temple to begin their daily preparations for the worship of that day. And here we find this in the Gospels. Jesus tells Peter, before this trumpet blast, that's when you are going to deny me. And of course, Peter does. And when cock crow happens, Jesus looks at Peter because they're seated in this courtyard together. He's then taken in to the council chamber where Caiaphas and his cronies are going to ask a fundamental question, do you or do you not believe yourself to be God's Messiah? Of course, Jesus does. They have now what they need to hand him over to the Roman governor. They want Pilate to do their dirty work. And so they take him to Pilate, and they're going to lay three charges at him. One, he forbids paying taxes to Caesar. Two, he stirs up the people. And three, he proclaims himself a king. All three are saying the same thing. He is a political enemy of Rome. And Pilate's going to say, are you the king of the Jews then? To which Jesus responds, you say that I am. But Pilate does not see Jesus as an imminent threat like the chief priests do. Probably because one, they understood the implications of Jesus and his movement, but two, he was a direct threat to them. So Pilate tries to pawn Jesus off on Herod Antipas the son of Herod the Great, who was the ruler of Galilee during Jesus' ministry. This is the guy who removed John the Baptist's head from his shoulders. Antipas had wanted to see Jesus, but Jesus really didn't play the dog and pony show for Antipas. But Antipas and his soldiers dressed Jesus up in rich robes and mocked him. 
this is what we think about you as the king of the Jews. And they sent him back to Pilate. Who is Pilate? It's interesting to note that Pilate, of all the Roman governors of Judea in the first century, had the longest tenure. Pilate also is described by the Jewish writers Josephus and Philo, both from the first century, for his brutality and his weakness. Pilate often would do things to provoke his Jewish subjects and then in response, respond with extreme brutality. In fact, when we read the Jewish sources about Pilate, the word to describe him is butcher. You say, well, that doesn't seem to fit what I read in the Gospels. And for a long time, people struggled with this until a discovery was made in Caesarea that sits on the Mediterranean sea coast in the land of Israel. And there they found a stone with an inscription from Pontius Pilate. This stone dedicates a small temple to the emperor Tiberius. Now, most people, when they see this stone, they just get excited because, well, there's the name Pontius Pilate, and they fail to realize that this stone gives us the bridge between Pilate the butcher and Pilate that we find in the Gospels. Because this stone gives us a window into the psychology of Pilate. Let me explain. Roman citizens like Pilate did not worship living emperors. In fact, the only evidence that we find in archeological remains and in ancient sources of any Roman citizen worshiping a living emperor is this stone dedicating this temple to the Roman emperor Tiberius. In other words, Pilate is showing an exaggerated devotion that culturally for him is unheard of. What makes this even more interesting, the Roman historian Suetonius tells us that Tiberius questioned the cult of emperor worship. So here we have Pilate building a temple for a living emperor, something unheard of for a Roman to do, for an emperor who even questions the worship of the emperor. What does that say about the psychology of Pilate? It tells us that this is a very weak individual who wants to ingratiate himself into the halls of power. When someone that has that kind of a weakness to be a suck up is put in a position of power, often they abuse their power and compensate for their weakness with brutality. We find stories where Pilate, trying to provoke his Jewish subjects, gets backed into a corner and has to back down. And that's exactly what we find in the Gospels. Notice that the chief priests know this about Pilate. He wants to be the friend of Caesar. On the coins that Pilate mints, he depicts pagan symbols connected with the worship of the emperor cult. Again, something unheard of for a Roman governor of Judea to do. The chief priests know this and they even tell him, if you do not kill this man, you are no friend of Caesar's. They push the button that they want. Of course, another character we find in this story is a man by the name of Barabbas. Barabbas was a Jewish rebel. He idealized Jewish hopes of redemption and the expulsion of Rome. One of the questions that we never ask is, why is Pilate crucifying anybody in connection with Passover? Remember, Passover is the Jewish festival of liberty. It's the Jewish 4th of July. And what we find happening here is Pilate is crucifying not just some random person, but a person who identifies with Jewish hopes of liberty and liberation. It's kind of like him saying, 
you guys celebrated your deliverance from Egypt yesterday. Let me remind you who's in control. Also, the two thieves crucified alongside of Jesus, the term that we find used to describe them means that they also belonged to such a movement. They weren't just pickpockets or larcenists. These were individuals who represented Jewish hopes of liberty. But people that belonged to the groups like Barabbas, how did they respond when Rome shed their blood? Did they turn the other cheek like Jesus said? No, they picked up the sword and they fought. So it could be part of the reason why Pilate wants to crucify Barabbas is because he knows how Barabbas and his followers will respond. And that will allow him to take the gloves off. But the chief priests continue to press for Jesus. And so Pilate gives them what they want. He turns them over to be crucified. And Jesus is beaten, a brutal beating. We know from Roman historians that many people died during the beating on their way to be crucified. Crucifixion was one of the most gruesome forms of execution ever invented by human beings. Ultimately, it's about crowd control. It is about creating such a grisly and terrible scene that people walking by note to self, this is what happens when you mess with Rome. So Jesus would have been taken from where Pilate was located. Most likely he was in the palace that was built by Herod the Great in Jerusalem. He would have been led out of the city and along the road, he would have been fixed to the cross. Excavations in Jerusalem in the 1970s actually uncovered an ankle bone of a man who had been crucified. And the nail of the, was still in the ankle. And this tells us a lot about the anatomy of crucifixion. The upright beam would have been fixed and in place. It would have permanently been there. That's probably why this place is called Golgotha, the place of the skull. Has nothing to do with it being a hill. In fact, the Gospels never say it was a hill. Moreover, it has nothing to do with it looking like a skull. Rather, it's a known place of execution. The condemned after being beaten savagely would have been taken and what we now know is the way they fix the legs to the cross is they would have the individual straddle the upright pole and then put a piece of wood on the outside of the ankle to increase the surface area of the nail head and drive the nail through the ankle. Therefore, you were fixed straddling this piece of wood. You would have been stripped completely naked you would have a small piece of wood under the buttocks to kind of give you a little bit of a seat. And in this position, all of your weight is being borne by your legs. So they could have actually nailed Jesus through the palms of his hands, although they could have also nailed him through his wrists. But in that position, you can breathe fine. So sometimes you may hear that he died of asphyxiation. That doesn't seem to be the case. Most likely he died from extensive blood loss and what is called hypovolemic shock where your blood pressure bottoms out and you simply die. Notice also that after Pilate chooses to condemn Jesus, he is now going to participate in his soldiers' mock coronation of Jesus. And this is where the title that is going to be fixed onto Jesus' cross comes in. This actually would have been worn around Jesus' neck as he went to the place of execution. 
This is not Pilate's profession of faith. Rather, this is the crime for which Jesus is being condemned. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. But it's not just his crime, it's an open mocking of the Jewish people's desire for God's redemption. Again, Rome is saying, this is what we do to your redeemers. Because this happens on Friday, the Jewish people are getting ready for the Sabbath. Jesus dies on Friday and they put him in a new tomb. They don't have time to prepare the body and therefore they simply lay him on one of the preparation benches inside of the tomb and seal the entrance to the tomb. Most likely the way that they would have sealed it was with a stone called a blocking stone that think about a cork that goes into a bottle. This particular type of stone in Hebrew is called a golel that means to roll where we get this idea when the women ask who will roll away the stone for us. And his followers go and celebrate the Sabbath. And then early the first morning of the week, they come to finish preparing the body for burial. I find it fascinating that none of the gospels say that Jesus was buried. And you say, why do you find that fascinating? Because this tells me that these gospels written after Jesus's life are preserving very specific technical details. Jesus was dead. His body was put in a tomb. We may say, well, that's burial, but not within Judaism in the land of Israel. In Judaism in the land of Israel, you do not consider someone buried until the whole process has gone through. Notice that even on this little detail, our gospels got it right. The women are coming to the tomb early in the morning on the first day of the week, which is why we celebrate on Sundays. And they found the stone removed and the body wasn't there. Jesus is going to appear to his disciples. He's going to appear to disciples of his walking from Jerusalem to a town called Emmaus. And the apostle Paul says he appears to over 400 people. And the foundation of our faith is the historical reality that Jesus walked out of the tomb. Understand, there were thousands of Jews that died in the first century on Roman crosses. But only one walked out of the tomb by the power of God. This is why Paul is going to say in Romans that Jesus was son of David according to the flesh, but by the power of the Holy Spirit through the resurrection, he has proclaimed the son of God. This is why in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, if Christ be not raised from the dead, then our faith is in vain. This event is the bedrock of who we are. Jesus walked out of the tomb. God raised him from the dead. God accepted his obedient sacrifice and as proof of that, raised him from the dead. And the proclamation of the New Testament is because Jesus walked out of the tomb. As we are faithful to God, we too do not have to fear death, that we too will rise from the dead. This is our story. This is who we are.